Welcome, everybody. I am Pam Goins, Executive Director of NASCA, joined by Jamie Rogers, our Deputy Director, Kayla Leslie, our Program Coordinator, our entire Richmond, Virginia Studios team, um, and four really awesome state panels that are coming up this afternoon. So we're going to get started. Um, each of these states were wonderful to really do a micro review with us, have an opportunity for our team, Scott's team, to uh, just really take a, a close look at some innovative practices that had to occur because of the global health pandemic. And so what we want to do is to really expand that conversation today, learn more from them. Um, we're going to bounce back and forth between the Richmond studio and the Lexington studio with facilitation. So um, without any further ado, let me kick it over to Jamie, who's going to talk with our Colorado team. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, well, I also have my lovely The Breakfast Show here, Scott, who's going to serve as our kind of co-host. But I'm going to start with um, asking my Colorado team to join us. Go ahead and turn on your cameras. And first up, I'm going to introduce Cara Veach. Um, Cara, I'll ask you here in a second to introduce all the amazing team members it has been a pleasure to watch in this recording and really learn about your employer of choice initiative um, in Colorado. So I'll kind of give a quick overview, but also know your team can do it a lot better than I can, is that it started with an employee engagement survey. And then you guys did some listening sessions, uh, 45 listening sessions when I was watching through your recordings. Oh my goodness. You guys had a virtual site where you also took feedback. And then based on all this feedback broke up into six work groups and those work groups, I was looking through your strategic plan, built out a roadmap. So over the next three years, you're going to fill out kind of that roadmap uh, based on these six goals. So it was really interesting to learn about all of these six different goals and uh, what you're going to do. So you guys had a group on compensation. Um, you had one on talent growth and development on EDI. I always love being in Colorado because they switch around the letters on us, but EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, health, safety, and well-being, recruiting, and work perks. So Car, I'm going to kick to you first. Kind of this, I went over it really quickly. If you guys haven't watched it yet, go watch their recording. Um, tell us a little bit about the really quick version of this initiative, but also introduce your team. Sure, Jamie, I think you hit all the highlights. The vision here was really to uh, become an employer of choice, but understand what employees want. Like I could have gotten these people, the panelists with me in a room, we could have come up with a plan ourselves, but really going out and listening to what employees want in an employer of choice, as well as uh, potential applicants. So with me is Tim Barker. He is our head of the Center of Organizational Effectiveness, which is our statewide training program. Uh, I think important to note in Colorado, we have like a centralized, decentralized model mm -hmm. of HR. So our role is to set the rules, policies, and procedures and support the agencies in accomplishing their goals. So each agency also has an HR department that does things like their own hiring, managing performance. Uh, Clara Woodmansey is our Director of Consulting Services. Uh, no consultants can hire her away, but what she does <laughs> is she uh, basically serves as a consultant to all the other agencies on our rules, on uh, difficult issues that they're facing. Um, and then John Bartley is our Deputy Director for the Division of Human Resources, so that is our statewide organization, and he has been pivotal in our, um, what we at Colorado call EDI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion efforts. Yeah, I learned so much watch, watching through this session, um, but let's just kick it off first. You had these six groups. One, was that, and th did that come all from the listening? And then now that you guys have started, you've met with all these groups, will you have stuck with those groups? Are those the same big subjects? If, if another state is doing this again, is that how you would divide up this project? Great question. So all of these came from the listening sessions, but I will be candid. Uh, Ramona Gamal, the state chief human resource officer, mm -hmm. and I, who did the listening sessions, we said, regardless, equity, diversity, inclusion is going to be on this roadmap. But it came up in a variety of sessions. It comes up in our, um, we do a 
every other year all employee survey it comes up in that as well um, so certainly employees wanted it but these came from employees i still don't know that we would change it but we might change the emphasis so work perks has flexible work arrangements kind of hidden under it um, and i think you're what we always want to do is set stretch goals but I don't think when we set the strategic plan, we would have said we want 60% of our employees to work remotely. That never would have happened. And that's where we are now. And flexible work, as everybody knows, and every single state is, is dealing with this right now, is sort of spitting into a different group, still under employer of choice, but we're using a group of deputy directors because we convene all the deputy directors and the HR directors together to kind of help us think through flexible work arrangements and the supports they need. Uh, going forward. So overall, let's say a state is just starting those six categories, you still feel really confident, but definitely now that telework has massively increased in scale since you first started, that has also kind of spun off and there's more work around that. Yeah. So another big theme in watching this, and I heard it echoed throughout everyone, was this idea of collaboration. So I even pulled a quote that you said is, how do we use our state expertise differently? And you had talked about how you use the expertise of your economic development cabinet. You use the expertise of a diversity coordinator. So almost using what other expertise you guys had in the state. And I thought that was a really interesting uh, concepts. I don't know if either John or Cara, whoever speaks to this best, on how you really leaned on other state experts outside of your agency to make this work. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think it's actually been one of the big success stories, at least from my perspective, is, is convening groups of state uh, employees, uh, whether it's in a specific functional area or it's because they are experts in a certain field. Um, but I guess in particular in the work that I've been doing with regard to EDI, you know, we found there was there were pockets of this work going on in different agencies all over the state. Cara spoke to our centralized and decentralized model and I and I think what our our particular successes and, and I think a lot of the learning that we've done has been in convening these um, interested parties from different agencies, um, and, and it's kind of happened in different ways. Two examples would be the EDI cabinet, which um, Cara has been pulling together, which is EDI officers and interested cabinet members from different agencies. And that's given us a forum from really discussing the sort of the larger issues with, uh, with regard to leadership um, and EDI. Um, in a similar vein, our agency has been charged through the executive order, um, our, ex uh, our equity, diversity, and inclusion executive order um, to address accessibility in, mm. in many different areas. And our agency has convened statewide experts in the area of you know, areas of physical space, um, technological space, including websites, and then communication, including language, um, so that we're hitting accessibility in all of its many different facets. Um, and as we pull more people into that conversation, I think we're even identifying other areas and opportunities to involve other stakeholders. So I, I think that's been a lot of the success story. There's a lot of eagerness to be part of the larger conversation. Um, and I think, I think that's moving us in the right direction. John, can I jump in there on that accessibility front? Has has that target shifted as a result of the digital environment that people are working in where we might have thought about sort of accessibility doors and ramps, but now you're thinking about a different type of accessibility? Yeah, I was actually just in a conversation with a couple of employees yesterday who are thought leaders in this space. Um, and what they told me, this is really, you know, part of my own learning this year has been in the, in the accessibility space. And what they said was, it's really interesting over the last couple of years and actually kind of distressing because technology has moved at a, has been outpacing accessibility. So mm. when you think about online training or you're thinking about timekeeping systems um, or, or even you know, our move to the Google environment um, from, from Microsoft, um, 
you know, the, the path has not been smooth from an accessibility standpoint. And employees will share with you um, that they feel like they're one upgrade away from losing their jobs, you know, and that's when it becomes really pretty serious. When that's just talking about our employees, that's not even thinking about public facing how we're, inter uh, how we're interacting with um, Coloradans with disabilities and ensuring that, um, that our, our materials are accessible or, you know, um, recent immigrants or, you know, people uh, for whom English is a second language, if they've got to dig down six different pages to get to a translation that will help them access the information they need, that's not accessible, right? And so we're, we're, we're looking at this question in a new way um, and, and involving, trying to involve the community to help us gauge where we are and how we can be better in serving them. Yeah, excellent. And I, you could just tell in watching through um, how much accessibility EDI really echoed through all of every single one of the big work groups, you know, you could see an EDI component of that. Well, Clara, the next question is going to come to you. Um, you talked about potentially before this, you're going to have a, a branding campaign. And now there may not be a, a branding campaign. But there was something really unique that you talked about as a recruitment tool is creating an authentic community engagement. And I saw that in your uh, strategic plan is really building authentic relationships also with an EDI lens as a way to recruit employees into the state. So talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're so excited about kind of, you know, I, I think COVID has forced us to think in new and different ways and to really think about how we collaborate and engage differently. And, um, you know, everybody loves a project that checks multiple boxes mm -hmm. for us, you know, and this, this one um, just seemed like such an obvious solve. If we can't, you know, spend money right now to do something really elaborate in terms of employment branding, um, we at the same time know that we have pockets of job seekers. We have groups that engage with job seekers. We have groups that reflect the demographics that we would like to see more of in our population, you know, and usually all it takes is um, making a connection and finding out a two things. And I think this has been a big learning for us. It's not just, do they have a job board where we could mm. post a position, but what services can we offer their clientele? You know, one of the things that we know to be true about employee engagement is that volunteerism, um, mm -hmm. the ability to work differently in the community is something that's really valued among not just candidate pools, but existing employees. Uh, you know, so we're looking at what are the opportunities to go out and work with groups and do things like mock interviews, resume assistance. You know, how can we be of service you know, while getting in front of their job seekers and sometimes even their employees, you know, it's a secret extra strategy, but anything we can do to get out there and, and create those two-way dynamic relationships, that is branding and that's no cost branding, right? But that's really, that's really showing who we are as a state. It, it's telling of our culture. It's, in, you know, it helps us expand our cultural point of reference in terms of getting out there and understanding with the communities interest needs, what are, what are their perceived barriers? So that's definitely um, something that's been really fun and continues to evolve. And um, I don't know that we know exactly what we're doing, but every conversation I have is that much more fascinating. Well, in reading that it also seems like that's something that other states could replicate, really that commu um, authentic community engagement and building those relationships. We've done a previous session, There there is a network gap in knowing about types of jobs. And so if you're building those engagements, you're overcoming that network gap of I knew how to apply for a state job. But hey, I, I did have this interaction with state government. All right. Ten, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say it also helps um, soften our image. Mm. You know, when people see you as a person, because I've had a conversation with you, they start to see the state differently, we become less of, you know, the man and more of, oh, yeah, I met someone and we had a great conversation. I mean, it, it just, it speaks, it does volumes of work for us. Well, and I loved how Cara ended. I don't know if you guys have watched the recording, but she said, you know, I want in the future for people to come up to me and say, how do I get a job in state government? I want my neighbor to come to me and say, how do I get a job in state government? And so when you're talking about softening that image 
um, wanting to work in this kind of place. So the next question is going to go to Tim. Another big winner, um, something we didn't get to dive into a lot in the recording was the system of LMS. So that throughout this whole process, your team realized there wasn't a, a one way to get out training. And it, it seems like you guys built different systems of a learning management system. So talk about what your solution there. That's a big yeah, winner. It was, I, th I think that the, the need to build that system came from the initial collaboration that Cara talked about. So when we did a good job of, of reaching out to our customers and finding out what they needed, what we quickly identified was one, many of our customers already had systems in place mm -hmm. and and the cost of changing systems would have been cost prohibitive okay. they weren't really interested in doing it they had a lot going on there and then we also had uh, a, another group of agencies that didn't have anything so the diversity of needs within our customer group could not have been greater and mm -hmm. so I, th I think that collaboration is is just been the, the key to success throughout this. Um, we convened groups. We knew who the, the general agencies were, and we asked for people in each one of those. We asked for representatives in each one of those agencies, and, and that made it really easy to determine who had systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and then who didn't have systems and then john and, and some of the the groups that he had been working with uh, created this relationship with one of the higher edu educations within mm. the united within the within the the um within the state and uh, they were able to provide a low cost easy to access solution that was already being used within the state it, it didn't have to be a new system so i think that the success of this project of you know, so what we ended up with was um, right now 98% of the agencies within the state currently have access to LMS technology and that remaining 2% is on is on path just hasn't implemented yet. So in less than a year, you know, we turned on LMS functionality for a lot of agencies and and through that communication through the engagement and work that we did earlier um, we've established you know a communication path we meet with them we have an email distribution list we have some shared online folders right there's no magic here but just establishing expectations that we want to hear what their needs are really listening and and part of the solution allowed us to have a very flexible solution we determined that we didn't need to create lms's and distributions mm -hmm. and content um, after doing a good needs system good after a good needs assessment we determined that we just had to make the content available for most and they could take it from there and for and for the the whatever it was roughly the 20 percent that didn't have uh, organic LMS functionality when we started, then we could put extra help and resources in those places by helping them figure out distribution systems and helping them uh, find administrators and, and pool learning with that group of, uh, of agencies that used the, the higher ed solution that they we were able to get some LMS functionality through one of our higher ed partners. And so I, I think, again, it wasn't us about really creating systems. It was about the initial drive for collaboration and engagement and then really listening and having a, a good sense of what our success was was getting this standardized content to all employees and and once we engaged our partners in that conversation the solutions became apparent well i'm and, oh go ahead john if i can just add to that you know and i think one of the critical factors is one it was something that our employees were asking for mm -hmm. In the uh, employer of choice listening tours they wanted more training more access to training and when we realized well you know some of them don't have access to training because there's no lms supporting them there's no platform to do it well and what we didn't know was how critical remote learning was going to be mm. here had we not engaged in that work and started the ball rolling um, we would have been in a, in a world of hurt in terms of trying to get information across to our employees or at least creating that ability for agencies to do so and to, to think about how they will train their employees in a more remote future. Well, I'm definitely sensing a very creative, cost-effective team here, you know, just creative solutions that maybe ne not necessarily weren't big budget lifts, big ask, um, and definitely something that we're going to have to do more of. 
So we only have about 10 minutes left. I know it's going super fast. If you guys, if the audience has any questions, feel free to um, ask those questions in the chat and we will ask those of our panelists. I'll see if, um, Scott, do we have any there? I don't see any. We don't currently, but I've got a question. Yep. Can I be? So Clara, I'd love to come back to you. Um, you were talking about making the state an attractive place to work and making it accessible to different um, I was in Denver a few months ago, and of course we go from the sort of beanie wearing hipsters of downtown Denver, you drive an hour north and it's agriculture and rural America. I mean, that, that's an um, incredible jump in terms of perspectives. How are you um, addressing sort of talent attraction in a state that has a booming economy to play to sort of multiple um, political audiences? I sort of use political with a sort of political outlook rather than a voting uh, lens, but how are you? How are you speaking to that from a talent side? Well, maybe one of the blessings of not having the money to do a formal branding campaign <laughs> has been that it's, it really is all about grassroots effort. And you know, we've had some interesting recent challenges, as I'm sure every state has, um, with our Department of Corrections and keeping them staffed, given the the, the level of. I, I believe that's very. That's the national experience mm -hmm. right now. Um, we we were actually able to do something pretty creative, I think, in tandem with um, unemployment to directly market open critical fill um, positions to targeted geographical locations. You know, nobody nobody has prisons for the most part in their metro area where their talent mm. exists, right? Like we all move them out to these random corners of our state, and that creates a tremendous challenge. Um, so that was that was one. I mean, that's not really engagement or interaction, but it was one way to kind of use um, geospatial data and understanding of populations to help start to solve a problem. And uh, we are very excited to continue our work with um, labor and unemployment to see you know, what other options exist for us. But you're exactly right. We have a huge rural urban divide. And so mm -hmm. that means um, that as we're working with groups in the state, we need to meet them where they're at. We need to understand who they are. We need to understand the drivers of the local economy in the areas that we're staffing. And we need to be sensitive to that. And so that will be part of our task it's interesting. So the, the takeaway was we didn't have the budget for a statewide marketing campaign, but that meant that it had to be localized. It was a localized right. voice, which almost becomes a recommendation. I love mm -hmm. that. Exactly. Exactly. So I haven't seen any other questions, but there are a few other things reading your strategic plan I wanted to dig into that you haven't covered yet. And I'll lean into Cara unless someone else wants to take it. You also mentioned recognition. And in there, it was noted that one of the top reasons that people stay is for recognition. And that's something that you wanted to keep um, in the future. What does that recognition or awards, what does that look like in the state? Sure, and um, everyone jump in. I think for us, um, one of the blessings of working in this administration is that recognition comes top down. Mm. Um, Governor Polis has been like out of the gate. I think he's convened my janitors who clean the Capitol like seven times to thank them. Um, but he's the one who comes up, he, he drives this. The other day in cabinet, we said something like, oh, I have a person who's retiring after 40 years. And the governor said, give me this person's phone number so I can thank them. Mm. And that kind of culture and thinking from the top has really um, put a spotlight on, particularly in this time, but also just generally thinking employees so they, it's everything from the big things to the little things. Everyone is in, uh, well, not everyone. I heard one state is doing really well and doesn't have a budget crunch, but most of us have budget crunches. <laughs> so compensation, states tend to fall behind on compensation. So mm -hmm. we have to be very thoughtful in how we reward and recognize employees. How do we use even those little, little dollars that we do have for more incentive and spot awards? Um, the other thing we heard loud and clear in our listening sessions is we have a free tier performance about a mm. system where you can be like one, two, or three. And we heard over and over again, we need bigger differential. So our high performers want to be able to be distinguished from our average uh, performers. Um, and that is something we will certainly be looking uh, and working on this year. Um, and of course, now we have a union. So mm. everything in our employer of choice 
um, not everything, but almost everything is now has that extra layer of bringing the union along. A um, lot of these things they are absolutely in alignment with. Um, and then also, I think for us, we've talked a lot about best practices from other agencies and learning. And so as we convene HR directors or deputy directors, what are those things that they're doing that are successful in rewarding and recognizing employees? Whether you have a meeting once a year where you recognize all your milestone employees, like reaching their 25th and 30th anniversaries um, and those kinds of things. So it's everything from money to like some people are note writers, right? Or some, and I think in this COVID environment, you've seen the level of communication and the level of appreciation skyrocket. We all know everyone's working really hard. And so being mindful of taking that moment to thank everyone for that work. You know, one thing I'd just like to add to that is I feel, I feel like there is a connection between the concept of rewards and recognition and something else we heard from the listening tours, which is career development, mm. which ties into training, which ties into what Clara has talked about in terms of attracting talent, which is this understanding that at the state, you have an opportunity to really grow your career. You can have many different careers within your state employment. You can move from, a from agency to agency and grow and develop. And, and recognition doesn't necessarily have to look like more money, it can look like um, more complex projects and responsibility mm. that help you develop your career and you learn new skills and competencies so that you can grow and move on. And, and, I, and I feel like there's, there's a way that all of these things play in the same space and overlap. Um, and, and I think the extent to which we can tap into that and help people, to Clara's point, see the state differently um, and to see, see the state really as a talent developer, as a place where you can grow and learn um, and, and maintain a really vibrant and fulfilling career um, and, and be recognized for your work in supporting your community all at the same time. I, I, think, that's, I think that's sort of the sweet spot that we can find. Yeah, I saw um, that. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, and I was just gonna kind of bring it full circle because I think the the way we do that is just kind of listening to our conversation so far in the last you know ten minutes or so is engage our audiences. We didn't have to create the need for recognition. We didn't have to create the demand for people to share these resources. We just kind of had to listen and 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 create and, and, and give them the venue, sort of get out of the way and 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 provide some channels for them to share this information and you know I think about Cara the the increase in the values programs that we've seen in in our agency and others and the increase in usage of employee recognition programs I think being remote has <laughs> exacerbated the the need for more contact and recognition and I think um, I, I would encourage any state or any agency to sort of tap in you know find out where that where that demand is and then put a simple system in place, the, the people will figure out, they'll tell you what they wanna do. We just have to encourage them. Yeah, and uh, one, John, I'm writing this down, but more recognition, I love that also can be more complex problems. I was rewarded by giving a more complex, hairy, sticky problem that I got to be involved in. Um, and then in the recording, uh, Clara said, you know, there's no one tapping on your shoulder saying, hey, you're at HHS, you would make a great candidate over here in labor, or you'd make a great candidate over here in leadership, in corrections and helping people understand that path. So what did you guys do? Is it a tool set? Um, how are you helping people career path in the state? We've done actually a couple of things. Tim had a bit big project um, that just got launched in this area. And then just really quickly, that's another kind of branding, internal branding mm. campaign that we're wrapping into EDI as well, which we we're thinking that um, what we'll do is work with our communications groups across the state and our PIO groups and find our success stories. Our success stories that might also happen to be diverse, right? And start um, really, showing through video testimonials how you know that the people who have been extremely successful of going you know coming in after high school mm -hmm. and then growing into leadership roles because we have so many of those stories state government is known for this this is something we all do really really well 
Um, and so that will go on our career page that we just launched. So now that we've got the platform, we can start building out content. That you can have this entire career with a bunch of different varied um, jobs over your tenure. So we only have about five minutes left before we're going to hear from Missouri. We do have a question that says, curious about the work around improving and ensuring accessibility for employees that look like at the state level for Colorado for both COVID world and post COVID planning. So it looks like ensuring accessibility for employees. So it sounds like we can do uh a little deeper dive at some point on this accessibility point, the state mm -hmm. of Washington wrestling with the same thing. And um, yeah, accessibility across the board, how you defined it was really interesting, both from uh, the right thing to do, but also accessing talent. I suspect there's some self-interest there too. Yeah, I love that. All right. So what is our last minute one pitch? We'll kind of just go around the Robin since we're closing out here. What else should states know about this initiative? Maybe something you wouldn't do again, your big aha moment. What would you like to tell your peers across the country? And I'll start with Kara. Darn it. I was hoping they'd go first. Yeah. So I could just say ditto. Um, I think for us, for me, it was a lot of consistency in what employees wanted. Of course, compensation, like, yes, but there was a lot of other things that you can do as an employer to recruit and retain great employees. Mm -hmm. um, and having uh, this team, and there's obviously other members of our Employer of Choice Initiative team work on, um, think, I think COVID has also created this opportunity where we could move things really fast, right? We have this mm -hmm. opportunity to change the way government looks. I mean, this isn't flexible work arrangements. This isn't, Claire was talking about how we were doing branding differently, and it's created this opportunity for us to think very differently. Uh, so I would highlight um, both of those. All right, since next on my screen, I'm gonna go to Tim. Tim, any big uh, aha moment or lesson that you think your peers should know? Yeah, I think the like resist the urge to go out and start some new brand new thing or go buy some new technology. Mm. I think the, the, the best practices, you know, listen to your people, leverage what you have, clarify your expectations. I think that's that's what's really guided us. Uh, that's what's given us the most impact so far. Yeah, I definitely could hear that trend. Super cost-effective, budget-friendly solutions at first. You know, maybe there's other things, but, um, and love the cat there. So what about Clara? I think my biggest takeaway is know your expert. You know, in the past, we would have gone to a consultant or a vendor, and now we can't do that. And so knowing who your thought leaders are in any given area, um, like if I need um, an assessment evaluation specialist, one, one of our agencies is bound to have one, start reaching out and just ask. If they're too busy, they'll tell you, but use leverage our resources. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thinking internally, you know, lots of these state agencies help external agencies and the state um, could be one of the largest employers. So can they also use their expertise to help internally? All right, John, wrap it up, put us in a bow. Any big lesson <laughs> learned? I'll do my best. You know, I think it's a, a lot of what Clara was saying, but uh, rather in terms of, you know, my work around EDI, it's tapping into the passions of, of people around the states. There were people who couldn't wait to get involved in this mm. work, who brought a lot of expertise um, and knowledge um, to it. And so I think, you know, to Clara's point is use your resources and, and tap into the passions of the people who you've already, you know, got um, uh, right at your fingertips, right? And just create the venues for them to share best practices, to share what they want to do. Um, there was such a hunger and a desire to, to um, participate in this work. And, you know, like I said, it, it starts to become an opportunity for employees to grow and lead in new ways and, and step into uh, to a new space. Um, and, and, and lastly, to give you some his historical perspective, because so often, you know, the things are, are bright, new, shiny thing. Mm. Um, somebody will say, well, you know, they did try that 10 years ago. And not to say that you shouldn't do it now, but here are some lessons learned from that. So you've got that value, you've got that human capital at your fingertips, and it's just a matter of 
tapping into those resources and those voices to help move your way, uh, move your work forward. And if I could uh, just add there, um, I think what we're all under these budget crutches. And so it's making us be more mindful of when we do engage vendors, mm -hmm. right? Being very strategic and thoughtful about when we bring those vendor partners on, because a lot of this work, uh, this work or all of our work, um, their expertise has been so beneficial, but it's really, we have to be much more mindful of what exactly we're looking for from them. Well, what such an amazing session. We have the longer recording and thanks for you guys' live Q&A. If you haven't checked out their strategic plan, it's on their website. I've run through it. Very informative, great resource if you want to replicate or duplicate or, or use pieces of their learning in your state. So thank you, Team Colorado. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. We're going to stay in this HR employee engagement space with the state of Missouri. So Scott, the floor is yours. So I think the state of Colorado has given us a great segue to our friends in the state of Missouri. I have to, my uh, Casey, Drew, Sarah, if you'd like to switch on your cameras. Um, and I think you've been set up for the frugal Olympics here because I know cost effectiveness is something that has driven the work that's been going on in Missouri. Um, so, so let's sort of raise the game on our friends in Colorado. Um, but just to set the scene, we were fortunate enough to visit with you all in person in Jefferson City just a few months ago. And so we talked on camera and the video is available on the Nazca website about the Missouri's professional development transformation. Um, but we had some great conversations on camera and off. And I'd love to just dive a little deeper into some of these things. But before we start, maybe one of you would like to pick up the baton and, and describe just what the professional development transformation was in Missouri in a couple of minutes. And then I'm going to ask you some really tough questions, my friends. Sure. Uh, thanks very much for the intro. Um, I'll, I'll pick up the, the intro and then Sarah and Casey will correct and fill in, fill in the gaps. Uh, our professional development transformation here in the state of Missouri really centered around the basic proposition that I think is a theme that you're going to have throughout all the presentations, which is if we're going to serve our citizens well, we have to make sure that the team members that we have have the, the skills and capabilities they need to deliver. And the background for it in the state of Missouri is that, you know, kind of systemic lack of investment in our workforce, you know, nonpartisan observations stretching back for years, multiple administrations, that this had just not been prioritized. And so, uh, in essence, in a multi year transformation, not with one initiative, but with a series of interlocking steps that would be mutually reinforcing. What we've tried to do is, is um, you know, version 1.0 is really trying to, to provide the basics for the skills and capabilities for senior leaders, emerging leaders, um, but also skills and capability building on demand for every single state employee through our Mo Learning platform in partnership with LinkedIn. And wrapped around this entire effort it was a shift basically scrapping the almost cliche um, annual review process, check the box, labor intensive, heavy data that really didn't lead to anything meaningful. And in fact, was in a way value destroying or led to cynicism about the process. And we estimated that that was um, close to a few hundred thousand hours a year was spent in that process with very little uh, value, we shifted that to a model that we can call uh, Engage 2.0, which centers really upon more informal. There's a blend of informal and formal structure, but it centers around monthly conversations between supervisors and their team leaders uh, about their professional development, about how they can succeed in their role, but grow through time if they so choose, give the tools to do that, and we've also wrapped around that a, a really state of the art, more formal, um, but easy to execute evaluation process that can be done with the cell phone on a quarterly basis. So it's not annual, it's done in a matter of minutes where our supervisors can answer a few basic questions. And what that allows is for multiple data points on uh, everyone to allow the true identification of those who are going above and beyond. Also as part of that innovation, 
uh, upward feedback in an optional form where we have about 50% of our state employees are providing upward feedback now on their supervisors, which is another way of unleashing the potential. Uh, and should note that the um, ability to do uh, evaluations on people, um, we can have multiple managers, for example. It doesn't have to be just in the line of control. If someone's working with multiple managers, there can be people participating in that evaluation process. So we, we have the wraparound of the skill and capability building, but we do have a, a shift from a annual kind of cliche, check the box to a more conversation intensive, but we do also have evaluation layered on top of that, but made it as easy as possible to execute. Okay, so um, Sarah, I'm going to come to you because Drew, as Chief Operating Officer, got the layup question that he can uh, speak from the governor's <laughs> office about how great everything is in the state of Missouri. Let's let's dive into the gritty stuff. So, as Commissioner, how did you find out, uh, to to paraphrase Drew, that there was a systemic underinvestment in your talent? Like, how did you go about finding what the problem was and what some of the solutions could be? We we actually did when we came in to this administration now four years ago, uh, we did a survey and we discovered um, how weak we were in some particular areas, in every area actually. Uh, so, so it was pretty obvious that we needed to really listen to what people were saying and telling us and emphasize the, the fact that they they were not getting what they needed. There was really no accountability. There was no uh, clarity of, lead of roles. There was no real leadership. They didn't see their uh, leaders role modeling what they should be. There was a, a whole variety of issues that we knew we had to work on, but by far the first one was to begin to invest in the people in the state of Missouri. And as Drew referenced, that that really had been neglected for, for decades. And you know, when you think about government, it's a service and it's only as good as the people who are delivering it. And so that was just the logical place to begin. Love it. So Casey, in your role as director of personnel, um, what did liaison look like with your peers in other agencies in terms of almost having the mandate to roll something out across government? How, what did that diplomacy look like? Yeah, so similarly to what Colorado mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we have a decentralized HR uh, system so that we have the 16 executive agencies who each have their own HR team, their own HR director. And uh, we, for the, for the first time in a long time, brought all those people together and uh, asked them what was working, what wasn't working, what their ideas were, and involved um, my, my peers, the HR directors from all the 16 different agencies in the decision making and the development process. We also involved uh, team members from all of the 16 executive agencies and the deputies and the cabinet leaders to be part Part of this development process, we uh, introduced to them best practices that we have learned from other states and other organizations. We did bring in um, some vendors to help us with the development of it. And I meet weekly uh, during COVID, it was, it was actually, or during the start of COVID, it was bi-weekly. Uh, but I meet weekly with all of the HR directors from across the state uh, to communicate um, the changes across this effort and many of our other efforts. And that uh, attendee list, we have, I mentioned we had 16 departments. That attendee list is up to about 80 people regularly on a weekly basis. And so I think that's testament to the fact that people are getting information that they need and the conversations that we're having is, is really the, the problem solving conversations. It's not just updates, it's problem solving and uh, sharing of best practices within um, all of the agencies and state governments. Casey, I want to dive in there. You've got 80 people voluntarily turning up for a meeting. What are they, what are they getting out of that? And let's drive into sort of self-interest. So why, why would I call into this call? What am I getting from that? Right. So uh, I think it's important to say that this talent, uh, talent development transformation is part of really a transformation that we're doing 
for all talent management within the state of Missouri. And so we launched our first ever uh, statewide recruitment tool. So uh, we had lots of ways people were applying for jobs at the state of Missouri. So about a year ago, at the same time as we did a lot of the Engage 2.0 work, we launched our new application site. And we launched Mo Learning a little over a year ago. And so, the, uh, and we also redid our classification and compensation structure within the past year. Uh, so we've been doing, uh, just, just to name a few, we've been a little busy. Um, but we, uh, the, we, we wanted to provide uh, an open communication channel for, because we had so many things going on, provide people updates and give them a chance to ask questions and see me as really a partner in this development as opposed to the big bad Office of Administration Police Force coming in and telling people what they had to do. So I'm going to bring this over back to you, Drew, and then Jamie, I'll point to you, see if you've got any thoughts on this. But um, so you're sitting uh, in the governor's office, making the case for investment during an incredibly tough financial year, maintaining investment during the middle of a pandemic. Um, what are those conversations with Governor Parsons looking like? Uh, great question. And I think that the, the backdrop behind it is because we've been doing this for a few years. And so we have results. So that's one of the important things is that uh, coming into the COVID challenge, the, the backdrop of the investment that we've been making in our state workforce is the, the proposition and I'll use a small c conservative proposition. I'm in a nonpartisan role, but basically that through the investment in improving the quality of the state workforce, we can deliver higher quality services with a more efficient and in some cases, smaller state government. And that case had been made with the data. That case had already been delivered in advance of the, a longer term story, so to speak. And so in the context of COVID, when um, as many colleagues across this, the, the country face some very, very difficult budget decisions, in that context, when it came time to reductions, it was explicit of, we are not going to scale back on our, our investment in skill building and our investment in our state workforce and the professional development. That was an explicit decision because it was made against the backdrop of, quite frankly, past uh, economic downturns, that is one of the first things that departments cut. They go like, wow, we can put that to the side. We're gonna put to the side training. We're gonna, that's an easy thing, right? But we made the very deliberate decision that, that we would not make those reductions in this context, precisely because the investment had been proven overall. The, that proposition of, if we invest in our state workforce, that allows more efficient, more effective, and more um, and better delivery to the customers of services. So we were able to make that case and, and should note that that was not just in the emergency uh, context of COVID, but in our upcoming uh, budget that the governor will be uh, releasing later this month in January, those investments will be continued. So it's against that backdrop of very, very practical results. And, and Drew, I didn't mean the question lightly because obviously yeah. you and Sarah are putting your personal names behind this and, and it is an easy thing to cut from the budget. Um, so yeah. I, I think the strength of what you're saying, but if I hear it right, the recommendation is make sure it's tied to return on investment. So just tie it to the numbers, tie it to the numbers. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just make the case of, uh, the, the reminder is, as Casey mentioned, this has had top level governor's office support from the start. And this wasn't a one-off initiative. This is part of a broader series that it is not one-off. We literally come back to it every month in cabinet meetings. We come back to it in every month in our deputies meetings. It is on the agenda, which is how are we doing on the talent management transformation? So it is, it is a recurring theme where the senior leadership has invested significant time it is not one priority among 57. It is front and center of how we're trying to improve state government. You know, I would just add to uh, along a parallel track with that, we've, we've also instigated uh, continuous improvement and operational excellence to really mm -hmm. teach. Uh, and, and again, it's an investment in professional development, but 
in improving the processes for delivery of services to, to our citizens more efficiently. And so hopefully there's savings along those lines, but we also need the investment in our workforce to get there. So it's, it's kind of a dual track. Yeah, I'm seeing also a lot of trends with the Colorado, that top level support, uh, people are really important, but also something that they had, Cara had mentioned that they're working on that it seems like you guys may be a little bit more um, advanced and want to get your tap your ear was these performance evaluations. Um, they had talked about, they're just kind of starting to redo those performance evaluations. And something you mentioned we haven't dug into a lot is the upward evaluation, evaluating your managers, evaluating your peers, that 360 evaluation. When we polled states, very few people in the public sector are doing um, upward or peer level evaluations. How are you guys doing that? Casey, you wanna highlight that? Sure. Uh, so just as Drew describes, you can, uh, all team members, every team member, all 50,000 of them can provide feedback on their phone to their supervisors. Uh, we had a lot of debates about the logistics of that and who would receive it and who would see it. Mm -hmm. And so some of the key decisions that were made is that uh, the information only goes to that supervisor. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the do, learn, do. We got to crawl before we can walk, before we can run. Um, and so that gave people and supervisors a little bit more confidence that we can do this. It's only going to come to me. I'm going to use this information how I need to use it. Um, we, uh, four times a year, team members can provide that upward feedback. And it's uh, two, uh, five or six basic questions. And then we ask uh, we have two open text boxes that just say one thing that your supervisor could uh, improve upon and one thing that they're doing very well. And so uh, they, it, as, as Drew mentioned, about 50%, uh, we are highest to date one quarter, we had 51%, we around 48%, 49% um, some quarters, but we're, we're really trying to help encourage that by sharing the success stories from supervisors who have never received feedback like this before and sharing the story of, I didn't know my team members wanted me to talk to them more. I thought they wanted me to stay out of their way and just let them do what they needed to do. But seeing, seeing, the, uh, seeing the data in front of them from all of their team members uh, has, I think, really, really encouraged that feedback loop between team members and supervisors and so strengthened the relationship, but also helped those supervisors with their own continuous improvement. I, think, so, Kate, sorry, I was just going to add on to Casey's point, just to, to two points of elaboration. One is we explicitly frame the upward feedback as developmental, not evaluation. So that is the number one. So it's like welcome and encouraged. So it is optional, but it is developmental. And as Casey framed it up, well, it, it goes to the supervisor and it is not used in an evaluation or gotcha fashion. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's number one. And I think the other interesting point in terms of the design, the very practical design for our colleagues, uh, this really emerged out of the piloting of our approach of Engage 2.0, where senior leaders were skeptical of, will this work? Are we right at this point in time that people will be willing to do upward feedback? Will supervisors really want it? But when we piloted it in two departments, this is one of the themes that emerged was actually supervisors really did want this much more, quite frankly, than we anticipated. And that shaped the design of, of the program, again, through the kind of do, learn, do, piloting it. This was one of the surprises, I would say, in the initial design, how receptive supervisors were, that they were actually looking for this developmental feedback. I, I'm going to stay here a little bit because I think this is going to be really interesting to other states, this upward feedback point. So, Sarah, I'm going to ask you a question. And Casey, I'm assuming you've got a phone and you're going to give Sarah developmental feedback <laughs> on how she answers this question, right? Um, Sarah, like, can we talk about resistance to this? Like, I'm, I'm imagining, I think it was Governor Parsons' inauguration just yesterday, right? So you're at the inauguration, you're mixing with state uh, legislature members, and they're saying, really, we're going to give frontline employees the ability to give feedback on a phone to their supervisors? Like, what, what does this look like? And then resistance from those frontline supervisors, what, 
I mean, I, I, obviously it's probably anecdotal rather than data. How are you, I mean, Drew touched on how you're selling it, but how are you policing this? And then how are you rolling this out over other agencies? I mean, is this going to the Department of Corrections, to state police? How, how far can you spread this mantra, so to speak? Yeah. yeah. You give me all the hard questions. I do. I always give you the hard questions. I'm sorry. I know, I know you'll give great answers. <laughs> no, it, it, it has you know that is part of the implementation we're and we're still implementing and we're still talking about the why why are we doing this and every it, it always seems to go back to that to convince people this is the way we get better we're helping each other get better and and you know when you put it in that in those kind of terms and you take the 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 being defensive out of it then most people start to understand it a little better, but we, you know, even now over and over again, through our town halls, through all our communications, through our engaged training, through a variety of different avenues that we talk to people and communicate with people, we are reinforcing that this, this is to help us all get better. You know, when you think about it, and this is still mind boggling to me, <laughs> some supervisors only talking to those people that they're supervising once a year. I mean, think about that. That that doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work when you don't talk to people. And so talking to them once a month and then hearing from them what that feedback is and how they can do better. Yeah, it's hard for some people, but for some people it's not. And, and we're just trying to coach people along the way that they have to, it's important to make these changes for all of us to work better together. Okay. I would add to Sarah's point, just to, to kind of put a point of emphasis, which is the rollout mattered a lot, mm -hmm. as in every single supervisor in state government had to go through the Engage 2.0 training, including all cabinet department leaders themselves. I went through it, you know, like a full day of training. And that's symbolically, it's symbolically, but substantively important. It's a common approach, it's a common vocabulary, and it's not just one day of training, but it, it shows like, that's a significant investment of time and energy. And then to say for every every state employee, there's a base level of training that they need to complete just to know the basics, the vocabulary, the approach. That means a lot. And we're continuing that onwards to refresh the why. But that's, again, symbolically and substantively is important in the change management. Yeah, it reminds me of like if you if you're an executive of UPS, you had to have driven a truck for a yeah, while. That's a, exactly. Exactly. Um, what does this thing cost? So if I'm sitting in a in another state right now, I'm saying, okay, this sounds great. What does it cost me? Um, run us through some of the numbers. Have we got a deal for you? Just wait. You know, we, we have steak knives. We have a little bit of everything for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll say a few words on it overall, but um, and then Casey and Sarah will provide some of the details. But the the design principle from the start was quite frankly and very explicitly, uh, if we want this to be sustainable, given the fact that people may be skeptical, given the fact that we may need to convince them, it has to be as cost effective as possible. That's number one. Number two, what that meant is explicitly, we need to be as much homegrown and home delivered as possible. That's second proposition. So when we do go uh, for external help, it has to be with a very, very good business case to get support, which we've been able to do. And Sarah's led the effort on that with the General Assembly, but, but very targeted. There have been targeted significant investments, but they've been targeted. So um, overall, much of it is designed and delivered uh, homegrown, so to speak. Much of our training and things like the Missouri Way training designed and delivered homegrown. Our leadership academy basically designed and delivered homegrown. But the backbone of the uh, Engage 2.0, and Sarah can speak to the legislative support for that, that required investment mm -hmm. to make the commitment. And our Mo Learning Partnership 
you know, those, those partnerships do require a broader base of stakeholder understanding and support. So I don't- Yeah, the, you know, the, I look at it like this, the General Assembly uh, was our partner in developing what we call reward for performance. So they did provide one-time funding for us to get some outside help to construct what we've done. But as Drew pointed out, we've gone, we've gone way beyond that initial uh, investment. That was to really put together our engage and how, how do we you know, fairly and accurately measure performance. And that, that, was a, that was a significant investment over a period of time from the, from the General Assembly. And then Casey, you may want to speak to some of the other, uh, well, I will say this, yeah. the, mo, the, the mo learning cost is very, very effect, cost effective. It is, you know, less than five bucks a person. So just, for what you get, and, it's, it's, it's a good deal. Casey, before we jump to you, I just want to make sure. So what you're saying, because we have external partners in the private sector that are listening to this call, which is there's very much a place for the private sector, but yes. define that space, make sure it's value driven. It can be profitable, but it's likely to be tighter scoped in this budget environment. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, our uh, it's no, it's in the public no, domain. And it's no, no secret. And, you know, we're proud. We had a performance partnership with Deloitte was our partner for the de design of Engage 2.0. It truly is uh, kind of state of the art. And I would say that compared to the private sector as well, I think that we're very comfortable and the standard was we want to be as good as anyone and in how we're designing the training, the rollout, the tools that we're using, the evaluation. Uh, and Deloitte was a, a central partner in that. And in our Mo learning uh, effort, and Casey can describe that in greater detail, our performance partner on that is uh, LinkedIn and LinkedIn Learning as a, a, a very robust partnership across multiple aspects of what we're doing in our talent development. Casey, but Casey you that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this is a great segue because I really wanted to make sure that we got in the piece of the technology, because as Drew said, um, we wanted to be as good as any private organization. And part of that, it was making our team members feel good about the technology and the, and the capabilities to do what we were asking them to do. It needed to be easy. It needed to be slick. And so we partnered, I don't know if we're allowed to use, uh, so we partnered with Qualtrics and uh, which is a, a survey platform. And we, I had some previous experience with Qualtrics and so I knew what the capabilities might be, but we have really stretched uh, what the capabilities of Qualtrics to match what we needed them to do, needed it to do. And so just like supervisors and team members fill out their evaluation and their upward feedback, they also get the results on their phones. And so supervisors, when they get, see their upward feedback, they have a cool little dashboard. It's color coded. Uh, you can have cool little word clouds in it. And then all the evaluations are also on a dashboard and have different ways that you can slice and dice the data. And in addition to that, we are leveraging that Qualtrics platform for dozens of other data collection purposes around the state. Colorado mentioned that you all survey your uh, team members on a regular basis, we do what's called a quarterly pulse survey. And so we survey all 50,000 team members every single quarter, and we're leveraging Qualtrics to do that. We're also leveraging Qualtrics to do onboarding surveys, exit surveys. We are, we are trying to uh, do as much data collection as we can now that we have this platform. And uh, so in terms of cost effectiveness, we have tried to stretch, stretch it for everything that we've got. I will say that my division, uh, Division of Personnel, has really brought in, um, we've been able to attract and recruit some really top-notch professionals on all pieces of the talent management transformation because of the excitement that we have with all of these and uh, all of these projects. And so as Drew mentioned, a lot of it is homegrown. The ideas and the, the elbow grease is, is homegrown. Qualtrics didn't come out of the box being able to do what we needed it to do but it was my fantastic team members who were able to make it happen. This is terrifying to me, the idea that we're being assessed on a cell phone. How do you replicate that look of judgment that 
that Jamie gives me over the camera that I messed something up. Well, how are you replicating that? Jamie, I think we've got a question from the audience. Yeah, specifically, it looks like several questions on supervisors, but once you get this data, and you kind of talked about this, it wasn't an evaluation, but how do you then do use that to help improve supervisors' performance? Could I take it? Yeah, Casey. <laughs> So uh, we very, as, as we previously mentioned, we wanted it to be constructive development um, to begin with because people were wary, people were scared. This is the first time we were doing it. Um, and so the way that we have done it is telling the supervisors to take this data to their engaged conversations with mm -hmm. their supervisors. And so when Sarah and I have engaged conversations every month, it's an expectation that I'm going to bring my engaged upward feedback to my conversation with Sarah so that I can say, this is what I'm hearing. Have you seen this? What ideas do you have for my improvement in this area? And even more than that is that my, uh, we encourage this, and I know that our division does it, our department does it. I take the upward feedback, and as soon as I get it, I put it in front of my entire leadership, meet, my entire leadership team, and I say, Thank you for this feedback. Here's what you told me I need to work on. And here are the one or two things that I am focused on working on for the next quarter. And I hope that when you give me feedback next quarter, you will be able to say that I have moved the needle in this area or not. And so I think, I think that it's as silly as it sounds, I think it's a little bit more of the personal responsibility in terms of taking it to the engaged conversations, either with my supervisor or with the team members who provided me upward feedback. I think Casey just provided a great example that, and I'm sure that everyone online appreciates, but this is really about trying to change and we're using different tools, but it's fundamentally about changing mindsets and behaviors where people get more comfortable providing each other feedback and also sharing though their own developmental goals, right? When, if I go into a room, the, for example, it's quite common where I say like, how many of you have shared with your teams? What developmental goals do you have? And like only 10% of the people raise their hand. It needs to be 100%, right? If we're going to be successful, we need to be in an environment where people are professionally and constructively sharing, you know, this is what I'm working on to get better. And they should be welcoming that and inviting that and vice versa. And that's what we're trying to get to. Look, no one's naive. This is a multi-year journey. But the fact that we started the journey where there's skepticism of upward feedback optional, as an example, and you now have 50% of the people doing it in, in a year, that's an example of behavioral change. It didn't exist before. Now we've got about 50% of the people doing it voluntarily. Okay, we're making progress. Are we where we want to be? No. Will we be there in five years? Probably not. We're going to have to continue to, on the journey beyond that. Mm -hmm. But this is what we're trying to do is shape more fundamental behaviors and mindsets so that we get to a place where people are more comfortable with providing feedback and continuous improvement. Now, Scott, what I love about NASCA events is something gets mentioned at one year, employer choice, and then the next year we have 10 states that came and said, look, I implemented it. I think in a year from now, we're going to hear about upward uh, performance evaluations just based on the comments and people being so interested in what Missouri's doing. So we'll have to check back with everyone in a year now that you've inspired them. Yeah, I agree. And I love that Colorado was, I think the theme was accessibility of talent. And, and you're all saying, if you work for the state of Missouri, we're all accountable here at every level, all the way to the chief executive. And this is how we, this is how we operate. I love that. Um, Casey, Drew, Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I know you've got a lot on your plate. And uh, I just want to say thanks. And we hand over to Pam. And we're, I believe we're moving to the Commonwealth of Virginia. We are moving to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank, Thank you, you to Colorado. Thank you to Missouri. Um, great conversation really back to back there around human capital and the different things happening in the states. So let's take a little bit of a um, kind of side path, if you will, to um, perhaps something that we don't think about every day when we're thinking about um, the purview of a chief 
administrative officer and really the different functionality um, aspects that come under that role. And we were really excited when we heard from Virginia when they said, you know what, we had to kind of take a whole new path when we were thinking about our building inspections. And um, this really had to be something that we had to protect our staff, had to protect our teams, really just had to shift our whole thought process on how we were remaining healthy in our state, how were we were ensuring that we were getting out into the rural communities and still completing this task that we have to do. So I'm excited to um, introduce our panel from the Commonwealth of Virginia and um, our neighbors here in Kentucky from the Division of Engineering and, and Buildings to really share a little bit more about what's going on in Virginia, how they made this quick pivot and um, really how we can learn from this whole virtual and innovative practice. So I'm gonna start out with uh, Mike Copa. Mike, you wanna just introduce yourself and your team and then we'll jump right into some of our questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and now for something completely different. I mean, I listened to Colorado and I listened to Missouri and, and they're like up here thinking about stuff. We are boots on the ground, head down, trying to make sure that we get buildings built in a timely fashion, trying to make sure that we uh, get safe buildings built so that everybody that goes in can come back out. And uh, when we started it, we had initially thought about ways to do it more efficiently and this sort of spurred us on. And so the people, I can see Sandy, Sandy Whitehead, Sandy is the architectural supervisor and uh, she basically makes sure that all the people who are architects in my group who are assigned to each agency throughout the Commonwealth, we do about a billion dollars worth of construction a year, um, is managing their groups. You wanna say anything, Sandy? You're, you're muted. You're muted, Sandy. All right, there, now, now I'm unmuted. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. We're excited to show, show you what we have done and how we have managed to keep these inspections going on. Um, as Mike said, we do work for all of the um, agencies in the Commonwealth of Virginia where that Mike is the state building official. And our team of architects and engineers, um, we are required to, as part of our duties, to actually inspect the buildings. We review the documents and then we go out and we inspect the construction, make sure it is code compliant, it is constructed in accord with the building code, is accessible. And we needed to keep doing this despite the fact that COVID was here, but we needed to do it in a safe manner. And so by developing this virtual inspection program, we were able to keep doing our job, keep the construction moving forward and stay safe. And the next up is Steve Masco. Steve is the engineering and code compliance coordinator. Steve was the leader in this effort in that he is the code compliance coordinator and, and he is he's like the inspector general. I mean, everybody, when we go on inspections, it's like, where's Steve? You know, because, you know, he sees things out of the corner of his eyes that nobody's ever seen. Go ahead, Steve, introduce yourself a little bit. Steve Masco. Uh... Pretty much what Sandy and Mike said, we go out and uh, we or we are keeping construction moving uh, while we are keeping people safe. Steve, where are you right now? I think everybody's the one who asked this question. I'm in my like, workshop. Where, where, where's Mike put you? In the basement of the governor's mansion or something? What's going on? Oh, no, no, I'm at home. I, I haven't been into the office since March. So, no, I've, we've, we've all been working remotely. And I this is it. my second home, or really my first home. <laughs> the Mary, thing, say hello. The thing Steve has in his garage are untold. <laughs> uh, the last member of the group, is Mary here? Yes. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. right here. Hi, I'm Mary Hom. I uh, have been with DEB now for, gosh, about 18 years. That's the Division of Engineering and Buildings. And I'm excited to be here with you today to uh, share the virtual inspection program that uh, we've been implementing since uh, the COVID-19 started. Great, that's awesome. Thank you all again for being here with us. Um, so Scott, I think we need to do one of our field trips to Steve's office. That's what we need to do. And <laughs> we'll just go on site and, and pick around and see what he's got lurking behind that him. Uh, Mike, let me start off with you though. Tell us a little bit, I mean, we know 
states around the country had to shift overnight. And I hate to use the term pivot, but I mean, that's truly what we had to do. So was this purely driven by the global health pandemic? Had you all been thinking about this a little bit beforehand to get to some of your rural communities? How did this all start? Well, we had been thinking about, we had been actually doing static remote inspections where you had the contractor or the owner take pictures, photographs, you know, go in this room, take these photographs, send me these photographs and we will look at it. And they never get, they never got what we wanted. You know, what, you know, could you have the contractor move over five feet? Cause whatever he's standing in front of, I want to see, or could you turn the camera down and take a picture another two feet down? Because I know there's probably an outlet down there that doesn't have a cover on it or there's plumbing that's wrong. And so we had been using static or pictures for a while. And then we had been working toward because Virginia, although Virginia is not the biggest state, uh, it's there's parts of the state that are six or seven hours from us. When we start to go out toward the Cumberland Gap, it's a, it's a seven or eight hour drive, depending on where you're going, especially if you're going to a prison in the middle of nowhere. And so we were using a lot of time. We were using like you know, we would, we would go for a four hour inspection and, and we would be out for 16 in order to get it done. And so we had been trying to come up with a better way to do it. And we had been experimenting a little bit with the, uh, um, the remote inspection with the camera and everything that Steve can explain more, more specifically. And then on March 13th, we were sitting around going, you know, we're going to have to go home and we're going to still have to do this. And so we're going to have to just kick it in and, by pretty much in a month, 30 days or so, we had through a, uh, a collabor collaboration with James Madison University and with our IT folks come up with a way to do it. And uh, I don't think we've been on a personal inspection. Maybe Sandy went one on when, we had, when the session, when the previous session started, um, we're in the, we're into our session starts tomorrow. So we're going crazy. Um, for the general assembly yeah yeah um and so you know we just basically kicked it in in march and then started going and so i don't know what else to say but that no that's really really helpful so tell us a little bit maybe let's just unpack this so you've discovered that march 16th we're all at home you know you have to complete your daily activities you've not you know you have to keep the building safe what did this process look like how did you bring your team members together and then I guess more importantly, what did the leadership need to look like top down and then bottom up to really design this process? Well, you're, you're basically looking at the people who, the team members who came up with it and thought of it in, the, in, the, in, the, in me and Sandy and Steve. And, uh, and like I said to Scott, when we first started talking about it, he said, who did you have to get permission from to do this and I said uh, nobody because I got to get my job done and my my leadership the secretary at the time and my boss are I'm pretty much independent as a state building official and so it's like you know get your job done do whatever you need to do it and so again Scott asked me that question I said nobody you know I didn't have to ask anybody this is what we did how did we implement it we Steve and Sandy and I and two of my other supervisors have, have a meeting every morning at eight o'clock and we, we hash out what we're going to do that week or that day or that month. And uh, what would you say, Sandy? We probably met for about 20 hours that week to try to figure out what the heck we were going to do. And then well, we, yes, we did. We were not set up for teleworking. We were not set up for virtual inspections, but we, know, we knew we had to keep everybody safe. And so we made it happen. We figured out how to do it. Um, it, so was, Mike, it was a lot of discussion, a lot, a lot of meetings. <laughs> yeah. So you, Mike, you described this as being in the weeds, but Commissioner Steelman of Missouri just a few minutes ago was talking about how they tied uh, talent development to continuous improvement. And it's kind of interesting to me that you, that you didn't have to go up the chain because that's the expectation is that you just solve for this as, as a unit. Um, what does, was, in what way was COVID a gift in the sense that it almost gave that license to operate and to drive through some of this technology changes? 
a gift. That's interesting. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, an, an incentive for, uh, for, for changing the way we do operate. I'm, I'm just messing with you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I said it to you, I'll say it here. Um, our job is to think. So we are, when we are, I guess, somewhat unique in state government and that we are architects and engineers. And so most of my group are professional architects and professional engineers and the professional architects and professional engineers job on the whole is to think. And we think, we're thinking now, hopefully, and uh, we think from anywhere. And so it, if it was a gift, it was a gift to allow us to be more efficient, to think at home, to stay safe. I mean, I, when we when we get out of this this mess of COVID, when we start to be able to go back the way we work normally, which we need to do, there's no question we need to go back and do some on-site inspections because there's some things that you just simply can't do remotely. Uh, we're going to keep doing this, so it it was it gives us more flexibility and we're more efficient. And it's more cost effective, and so uh, as a gift. As a public servant, I think all those things are good. Steve, would you just describe what the what is? So we've just been hearing from Missouri around, you know, phone-based upward supervisor uh, feedback technologies. In terms of remote building inspections, we sat in Mary's office and observed an inspection going on. What's happening at the other end, at the front line? How is it all plugged together? Well, when we started this procedure, JMU had a a, a great big project that they needed to, to get going. So we, we worked hand in hand with JMU and we basically, we tried a whole gambit of, of ways to uh, to make this work. We, we tried it with Wi-Fi, we tried it with cellular. So we would go and we would set up an hour inspection with just one or two of us and we would go walk through the building and see where we could see and where we couldn't see. Um, am I answering your question? Am I going where you want to go? Yeah, we're interested a little bit, Pam, right, in the sort of the trial and error and what the lessons might be for other sort of applications, whether it's in engineering and architecture or any other sector of how, how do we sort of try these things out in government? And then to Drew Erdman's point just earlier is how do you do the behavioral change? And so, Mary, I'm going to bridge to you in a second about, you know, how are you getting your, your review teams to behave differently um, in all of this. What does that experimentation look like in convincing people to operate differently? Is that for me, Scott? Either of you. Throw oh, okay. it out there. Um, let's see. I think that the key is really to um, uh, um, uh, you go ahead, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this let me, one. Let me get for a second. Let me get for a second. We, we have, we're set up as teams and, and by Mary is the team leader, she's the most experienced and she's the team leader of, of, a, group of a group of people. And so um, the, the, the managing the people is such that we, we're not really doing anything different than we previously did. We're, we're just doing the job, we're just doing it remotely. In fact, I mean, and Steve can tell you this better than I can, is, is one of the things that we found is that when we're going on a site, um, it's like herding cats. When you go on a construction site with a $100 million construction site, there's 25 or 30 people that want to walk around with you and listen to what you have to say. And it's like, get away from me, you know? Whereas when we're on a, when a, on a virtual inspection, it's like, there's only one camera and there's only one person that's talking. So I don't know, maybe you can and, have yeah, and, and you're able to get the, the whole team involved with that one specific item that you see so you can get some resolution rather than having side conversations where one discipline's over talking about something else. And, you know, ultimately um, we still record our inspections the same way. They, they are a written documentation by the AE of, of the deficiencies. So this enables the AE to work more efficiently because there's, there's one issue going on at a time, not five or six side issues. When you have a large team, um, like Steve was saying, it's hard to focus in on the small items. It's amazing what you can see with a camera. For example, you can focus in on labeling of doors, which is hard enough for me to see just in the field, but um, you can get 
extremely clear pictures of that and, and uh, you know, check those details uh, really well with uh, the camera. Well, it sounds like you all really have had some very positive benefits, um, as you were saying, Mary, about being able to be up and close and personal. A um, couple of different things I'm curious about. Did it take any reskilling or upskilling on the staff and the teams on location? Did you have to train them any differently? And then also, um, let's talk a little bit about the budget impacts, some positive um, outcomes, if you will, of changing this to a virtual process. Sandy, you want to start with us, especially on the upskilling of the local talent? I'll talk about it a little bit, and then I, I know Steve would like to, um, he, he has some good information to share. But in terms of upskilling, so the people on the site, we have the agency, that's like the owner, it's usually them and maybe their project manager. The architect engineer is there and potentially their consultants, so maybe structural, civil, electrical. We have the contractor, the general contractor, and the subcontractors. We have many times the fire marshal. Sometimes there are like clerks of the work or other, other folks who are there. So we have a large group of people on site. In terms of um, training them to do it differently, the way that, that we develop this is the contractor is the one who um, shows the inspection. The contractor is the one walking around showing us what we're looking at. And we, the, the DED folks, the architect, and then we have four different um, engineering disciplines. We're all looking at our computers. And many times the owner's on, on his computer, the, um, the AE, et cetera. So they're all looking on their computers versus being on the site. Typically the only people on the site right now are the contractor and potentially the subcontractors. And the contractor is the one walking around looking at, we'll say, okay, go, you know, focus in on that pipe. Let's look at that fire proofing. Let's look at the fire stopping. Let's um, go over there and measure this, this toilet, the distance from the wall. So the contractor's on the site and they have a second person who is doing maybe the measuring or um, trying, you know, assisting them. So that way we can all see on our computers what we need to see. Steve, do you want to maybe talk about this a little bit? One of, one of the things that you, you ask about getting better at it is the, the, we, the contractors, once they do it one or time, one or two times, they know to go walk in the room and they keep their shoulders parallel to the door. When they walk in, they don't go in there and, and do that. We call it helicopter and where they go in there and spin around and you don't know if you're looking east, west, north or, north or south. It, it's, um, so they're getting better at doing that. Um, a lot of the contractors are using gimbal mounts where it it keeps the camera horizontal. Well, you all know what a gimbal mount is. It keeps the cameras still and horizontal. It makes it a lot easier. So we've gotten better at, at that. Um, they have the proper tools. They have a ladder. They have a good flashlight. They've got, you know, two people that are patient um, that will, uh, you know, we're, we're the one person you'll give the direction to and he'll, he'll the other guy will run the tape measure and we'll read it or they'll read it so it, it works pretty well that way it's like it's like rc construction workers you know you have remote control over these guys you have their name on their back the other thing that we have too though in, in department of purchasing and supply provided for us was a contract for this service so we've had instances where on a large contract with a large contractor, you know, a 50 million, $100 million job, it's like, it's like falling off a log for them. But on a small contract, sometimes the contractor's not ready for it, the owner's not ready for it, whatever the case might be. And so we have got, although we haven't used it much because most people have been effective at it, a, a separate statewide contract where we have got folks who will take two people, they will take the camera operator and the, and the tape measure ladder guy with them and, and we can have the agencies or we can buy that service as a, as a service to allow us to do it so that the training on the other end by the agency folks or the contractor is not necessary. And we did develop some uh, written guidelines uh, to initially give to the project managers um, uh, to help work it out in the field um initially so it's ma mainly before they get started just testing the site to make sure that they have a feed on the site 
Yeah, that's Masco can address that. That's we we you go down the basement of the two stories down in a concrete structure, you got nothing. And so you have to figure out what you can see and what you can't see before you start. So we, we already have our uh, attendees sort of uh, taking some of your ideas and applying them to their world. One, uh, one observation was that um, we've got the director of a state agency that ensures state risks on state property um, and has a contract for a vendor to inspect over 750 buildings, thinking this might be an application for a similar type of approach to, to do it remotely. So um, thank you already. You might be getting a phone call from a colleague in, a, in another state. Uh, getting some tips and techniques. Mike, I want to stay on the budget thing and come back to you. So you described sort of a, a an inspection in the far southwestern area of the state that of a 16 hour you know project time, a huge chunk of that is travel. How are you sort of reallocating uh, human capital time and budget time based upon what, what these sort of efficiencies are driving out? <laughs> That's implying that we have extra time. You've got tons of results. I realize you're about ahead of the session. You don't need your budget. You're all set. Right. Yeah. Um, this is actually a savings for us because, because we save time. And, and like you said, but we, we are but 26 people and we have a billion dollars worth of stuff to, to say grace over. And so it, 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 it's not really, we're not really reallocating anything. We're, we're, doing it, it's, it's sort of like, and I'll show my age, it's sort of like Y2K. We did it, nothing happened. And so what we're doing is we are reallocating our time to review and we are reallocating our time to problem solving and we're still doing, getting the job done for the inspection. And, and I, and I work the time, we're saving travel time and travel time we charge by the hour because we're an internal service fund. And so we're saving, we're saving the project uh, literally thousands of dollars in each by by it, by preventing or not by preventing by by not having to make each on the road trip. And we're actually doing more inspections on a given project because they are the travel time is not included and and we can do a one you know two one hour inspections at different parts of the Commonwealth in the same day. Yeah. The other talk. Sorry. Okay. The, oh, I'm sorry, Mary. The um, other t other advantage too by having remote inspections is if, say, we do not include this, the structural engineer, our structural engineer, on the inspection because we don't think there is going to be any structural issues that come up. If structural issue does come up, I call him on the phone. He hops on the inspection and he can quickly add value without the travel time, without being there for all the time he was not required to be there. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. And we are doing a lot a lot more inspections, as Steve said, in terms of um, concentrating maybe in two or three rooms, as opposed to doing the whole building at one point, at one time. So Mary, go ahead. Uh, no, I'd, I just echo, I think you've, you all have pretty much uh, covered everything. Um, I, I, I'm going to kind of go a little bit backwards. Um, Scott had mentioned how this uh, has changed our uh, way of working. It's not even just the inspections. It's also our review of the documents. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we were uh, doing a little bit of online reviews, but we're doing more. Uh, we, actually, we've transferred completely to um, uh, online review of documents. Um, you know, we were getting a lot of paper in our office and uh, we've completely transferred in that regard as well. So it's not just uh, the uh, inspections virtually, but it's also online um, uh, uh, reviews as well for permit. And that's saving a lot of money too, but just uh, for paper costs and uh, filing and, uh, you know, we, we're saving a lot of trees. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We're about to hop to the state of Texas to talk about sort of infrastructure to invest in uh, energy savings. And it's interesting. I think, Mike, where you were going was if you were to bump into Governor Northam, you'd say, hey, let us hold on to these efficiencies because we can invest in that thinking time again to find yet more efficiencies as you go through. So it's, it's back to that thinking time rather than driving time seems to be the banner. Yeah. yeah. And I'm curious too, Mary, you know, you were telling us a little bit about needing to make some practice change or at least share in advance to the um, 
into the field that there were some practice changes. Have you all captured that um, in a written format? What other policy changes were necessary? And are you keeping this as we're going on into 2021? Uh, as far as the um, uh, capture changes in the field, it, it's really just testing your site initially. We've come up with a, uh, a, a, a plan to, I mean, basically we've given them some guidance as far as how to set up these virtual inspections. And the first, again, is just to make sure that we test the site, make sure that we've got um, uh, you know, it, it will work virtually. Sometimes they actually have to pull a whole cable through the, the uh, um, building, especially like Mike was talking about basements. We had recently had a project and they actually had to do it in that manner because they didn't have uh, the, re the remote. But we, we have uh, the guidance uh, somewhat, you know, in writing to give to the agencies ahead of time before we even schedule those inspections. Um, so, I, I don't know that that's pretty much all that we have at that. And are you all expecting to make any grand changes in 2020? Is it something that you all want to continue to do? Oh, absolutely. We will uh, certainly, uh, you know, continue with the these inspections. And also the agencies are becoming uh, more comfortable with them as well, um, you know, because it's not just us changing, it's also the agencies changing the way that they do business as well. And we're yeah. working with them to help them. And this, this might sound bad or might sound arrogant, but I think we nailed it in the first month. <laughs> I really do. Well, I was just getting ready to ask you, Mike, are there any lessons learned? But it sounds like, no, it sounds like you all got it first try. Good. Let's go. I really do. I think we nailed it because, because it was one of those things that it's, it's, it's a small thing. It's, 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 it's something that you can wrap your hands around. It's not like Colorado and Missouri we're talking about where, you know, I have to figure out how to manage people. This is a, this is a task. I can wrap my hands around it. I can ball it up. And I got it. And I, I, I don't think, and I mean, Sandy or Steve or Mary, I don't think we're going to change anything. I think we, we pretty much got it. It's just a question of, uh, of getting people to embrace it and being able to have people do it in an efficient manner. And that's just practice. The only thing I think we could change is have people carry more spare batteries because I, that <laughs> seems to be the, the biggest problem is we run out of battery too quickly. Has there been pushback from the field at this point? Pushback, is that what you said? Pushback. I wouldn't say pushback, but I would say that, that people miss having us come into the field. I, I do think they, they are missing um, the value that we add when we are in the field. But they see that this is a way for us to keep going during the pandemic. They see that this is a way that we can keep construction moving and, and do these inspections. So overall, very supportive. And we we are we are going back when when we when we are immune or when we have herd immunity or whatever we have, there is no question that Steve's leaving his garage and going back in the basement somewhere because we we have to. It's just it's it's interim, but it's also interim in that it will continue on in a particular application. Oh yeah, I think what Mike's saying is we will continue both. We will do virtual and we will go back in the field. Um, the virtual will, will supplement the, the long the long travel time. Inspired. Well, Pam, um, so as you know, we're, this is the Nazca Virginia studios. So it means we're pretty close to these guys. And I picked up at the store the other day. Actually, I'm on dry January, so I can't drink this for a month. But it's the Virginia Beer Company having an optimistic or pessimistic uh, beer <laughs> And it sounds like the, the Commonwealth are pretty optimistic around their talents and whether they're keeping this going forward. So we can drink it this way, not that way. As I'm not, you're going to have to shoot it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, everybody, thank you so much for your time. And also thank you for your team who allowed us on site to film how all this works. And all of that video footage is available in, in the Nazca Resource Library. So thank you for your time. And we're now going to jump over to the state of Texas to hear about their amazing work and just how great the state of Texas is in driving efficiencies through government. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Scott, I'm excited to talk a little bit more about their process in Texas and hear from Robert and his full team.
Hey, Robert, Eddie, and I think Will's joining us in a minute now. Virginia has set the bravado bar here, and I'm, I'm going to be very disappointed if Texas can't exceed the Commonwealth. Well, we, I don't know that we'll meet the bravado. I don't know the, um, uh, the, the amazing projects that have all gone on. There's some really fun stuff. We, ours is, is a little different, um, and, and we hope that it's something that you know, some other states can look at and and maybe take something from that 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 uh, that other folks can use. So yeah, we're we're glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Great, Robert. I'd love if we could break this conversation between the thing, can the kind of energy conservation work that you've been doing, but also the structure in which you made it happen. That I think there are learnings in that for other states as well. So so maybe you could summarize both, and we'll dive into some Q and A. Okay. Um, yeah, first off, uh, Eddie Trevino is, our, is, the, is the director of our State Energy Conservation Office. I'm Robert Wood, Associate Deputy Controller, and I oversee part of our agency, including our including SECO. Um, Will Cunahan is on the on the call, and Will is is one of our managers who's involved in the program as well. So, real quickly, I think the thing that that we hope makes this useful to people is every state receives on an annual basis state energy conservation or, or energy conservation funds from the Department of Energy. And so, and, and typically for the state of Texas, um, that's roughly two and a half million dollars. I think we, and Eddie, you can, you can confirm this in a minute, but uh, that's, you know, either the largest or maybe second or third largest. But so most states get something less than two and a half million dollars and, and two and a half million dollars while that's significant, it's not going to make or break a lot of a lot of programs. What Texas has been able to do over a long period is put to, put aside some money. We first put aside back in the '70s some uh, some some energy money from from an Exxon settlement that Exxon had with all of the states. Most states spent that money. Texas spent some of it, but put some of it aside in a loan fund. Then in 2009 and 10 with the stimulus funds, the ARA funds that came out during the Obama administration, very similarly, we took, a, we took some of that money and rather than just grant it out, which many states did, we actually turned it, we actually made it a loan fund and added that back to our, to our loan fund. So the result of that is, in addition to the roughly two to two and a half million that we have a year in, in annual um, appropriations from the Department of Energy, we have a $230 million loan fund that spends off interest, both whether it's in the bank or whether it's lent out, spends off interest that, that we use for a lot, of, a lot of programs. So the result of all of that is rather than having a small, you know, a small grant program, which is what I think a lot of states end up using this money for and, and, and do worthwhile things, but we've, able, we've been able to create something that is uh, sustainable over time. And, you know, every year we, we kind of watch to see what, what Congress will do with the budget. And um, I think, you know, like everybody, we, we, you know, we want to continue to get that amount of money. But the reality is if we didn't get an appropriation or an appropriation of that size through DOE for a year or two or three, we would continue on, and and we've been able to do some some great, interesting, and fun programs. Um, and I'll let Eddie expand more on that. But that's Scott. I think that's the that was the reason we thought this was a a, a program that was worth bringing to NASCA's attention is that hopefully there's some states out there that can see a little bit of what we've done, and particularly in light of currently as as Congress debates whether or not there should be more uh, COVID stimulus. If there is stimulus money that comes to the state, the model that we've used in the past is probably what we would do again. And, and I think that that may create an opportunity for other states um, to, to create some sort of a, a sustainable program. Yeah, I mean, the, the model in of itself is fascinating. This whole idea of creating a loan fund, it's almost like microfinance works in developing countries where it's paid back and you're recycling the funds rather than issuing a direct grant. Um, Eddie, let's bring to life some of the initiatives this, that this model has been applied to. So give us some illustrations of what's been invested in in the state through this model. Well, through the loan program, uh, 
We work with public entities, solely with public entities, and that would include state agencies, local governments, public schools, uh, county governments, and state-funded hospitals. Uh, right now, we've got a loan out to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, so they're actually doing retrofits in the prisons, which is, which is a good thing, and they're doing retrofits of lighting and also of water. Uh, one of the problems that uh, prisons have, ironically, is they use a lot of water, and the reason they use a lot of water is because prisoners are bored. And so when prisoners are bored, what do they do? They flush the toilet. And so what we've actually done is uh, we're working with the prison to uh, change all of those fixtures out. And it's actually uh, going to be a significant enough reduction that the cost of all of the retrofits will pay for itself in eight years. And so we're working with uh, the prison on that uh, project. We're also working with uh, school districts and uh, taking advantage of aging equipment. They want to replace aging equipment because what they want to do is while kids are learning from home, take advantage of the time to make improvements to their facilities so that when the kids come back, they'll have a better learning environment, not only for the kids, but for the teachers as well. So we're working with school districts on uh, doing HVAC uh, replacements and repairs, lighting upgrades, and uh, even though there's limited access to the facilities, again, uh, they have access to the facilities during school hours where before they'd have to wait uh, for the holidays. Uh, we've, we've got another program. Did you want to ask me a question? I've got lots of questions, but you keep going for a second. Okay. Well, we've got another program that's a local government technical assistance program and where we provide... Uh, uh, energy assistance services at no cost to the school districts, to local governments, to county governments. And we do preliminary energy assessments. We have uh, technical assistance if they have a specific need and they don't have the personnel uh, able to provide those services. We'll provide the services in their behalf. And so we use that uh, introduction to introduce other services available at SECO as well. So I want to make sure we understand this. So this is essentially almost like when a state issues bonds for a big road financing project or something like that. But in this case, it's a state agency that's making capital available, but you're also providing expertise around how to do it. Is that what we understand? Yes, that? that's correct. The so capital, I, is, the yeah, capital is available for, for low interest rate loans. Uh, we're at 2% right now, which is about as low as you can get. And then the uh, services, additional services we offer are free to the entities as well. So uh, if I, let's, let's just get into the mechanics. So I love this part of NASCA. This is what we call Wonk Fest, where we go sort of deep into the granular stuff. Is, so if, I, if I'm running school district in a remote part of Texas, what do I do? So, so there's something that I think has some efficiency savings, but we don't have the local budget to provide for that. How do I find this? How do I apply for it? What is, how is it assessed and chosen? Well, one thing, it, it's really simple. It's a one page form that the school district sends to us. And they basically say, we feel there are energy efficiency opportunities at our school, can you help us? And so what we will do is we'll send uh, a group, uh, a professional engineer, a company that we contract with over to the site to assess their site. What we ask them to do is pick their worst performing buildings and we try to identify what the problems are. And then uh, when we identify the problems, we bring solutions to help them solve those problems. Some of those problems can be solved with their own maintenance staff and we make sure that they know that. So if they're not expending any additional resources. Other problems uh, can be solved through a revolving loan program. And so we share information to them about our loan program at that time as well. I'm curious too, Scott, if I can pop in here really quickly and maybe Will can address this, but is there a limited amount of resources? If so, how much? And then how then is this um, competitive? Is it a highly competitive 
process or folks just now learning about this? Tell us a little bit more about the process. Well, on the loan program, the it's first come first serve. Uh, so if you get in line first, no matter what the size of the project is, although our largest loan size is 8 million, uh, then you're gonna get uh, service first. For technical services uh, program, it's also first come first serve. And um, this will make Robert very happy. We actually had a little over three and a half million last year from the Department of Energy. And so those are the funds that we use to help uh, serve our public customers. Sorry, Will. <laughs> and Pam, to that, to that point, um, when the program, as I said, started in the 70s and started at about $90 million, grew to about $130 million loan fund over those decades. And then we added another, I think, 90 million to it um, out of the stimulus funds. And it, and it has taken a few years, as you would expect. You know, it was pretty well booked up at 130 million. And then it's taken a little while to absorb that. So, it, you know, it is a matter where we have to, you know, we continue to, um, uh, we continue to, you know, advertise the program. Uh, but it, we've never been so tight on money that it's been just, you know, something that, that people just, you know, discounted because there was never any funds available. Typically, there are funds available. And, and one thing I, I think also, um, Eddie said a while ago, you know, in, in the case of the example he gave with the school district where we pick out a, a, a school building and, and try to identify the issues, I think it's important. We have engineers both on staff, um, including Eddie, but, but engineers on staff as well as on contract who do that. That's not a matter of, you know, me and Will walking around going, well, hey, you ever thought about changing out those light bulbs? Um, you know, we, we, it's a it's a professional diagnosis, and so I think that's that's part of uh, what also makes the program I think very successful. So there's a question coming on chat. I'm not sure whether this should go to Will, Eddie, or, or Robert, or any of you. Uh, it's it's from David Workman, and it's like so: Are the agencies uh, how do they pay the loan back? Does it come directly from cost savings, or do you just presume that they're taking the cost savings and it's like paying back a bank? We, we function like a bank. Uh, they have to pay the loan back no matter what. Uh, and they pay back on quarterly payments on our state quarter cycle. So every three months we get uh, a loan repayment. The payments are based on energy savings. Uh, statute says you have to use energy savings to pay back the loan. Uh, that's why we have payback requirements to what qualifies for a loan. Right now, uh, our loans have to pay back within 15 years. And let's say that a retrofit project will pay for itself in 12 years. That will be the loan term. And so that determines the term of the loan and what can qualify as an approved measure in the loan. So, I, yeah, I think, you're, I think you're nailing the question there, which is, so the loan term is set by the benefits that are likely to accrue from it, but it's it's got to be tied to energy savings. That's yes. that's mandated. Yeah, that's okay. correct. It's tied to energy savings, but I think it's also important. Some agencies, of course, agencies in, in Texas and, and many places are funded either annually or or in Texas for two years, um, and that sometimes does cause some consternation. Sometimes you know they'll have their agency lawyers have to get involved and sort of do some do some analysis on whether or not they believe that that agency can can obligate itself beyond that two-year period. I think by and large, we've got over that, but that for, for sure, that's a question I think that states, if, is, is, if, if states move to this, that's a question that has to be addressed is, is can states obligate themselves for a 15-year period when they have a two-year budget cycle? Right. Um, so go ahead, Pam, I'm sorry. No, I was just curious. I was going to ask Robert, um, does this process or the, the loan program have legislative oversight or is this within your own agency? Always a touchy question, but I'm just curious. Well, no, it's, it's a great question. And it's a great question that we talked a good bit about um, um, when, when Scott interviewed us for the, um, for the, for the video. Um, what's really interesting is we have legislative statutory, we have legislative authority to operate the program. And, 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 but the legislative authority is fairly broad. And so we have been very successful over time at working with the legislature. I mean, we try to be very, we try to be very customer friendly, which obviously I think is part of the, part of the goal, but we work with the legislature 
to to help direct them. The, the, the authority we have is is very broad and allows us to do all these things. As all of everybody on this call realizes, legislators periodically want to micromanage things. They want to they want a specific, you know, pot of money to go to a specific cause. And we're no different. We have that as well. We have legislators who will introduce a bill for a very niche program that they that they see value in. We've been really successful, knock on wood, really successful at being able to work with our legislators and explain to them the value of having something that is that is very, very flexible and able to sell the value of it. So it does have legislative oversight, but thus far, again, knock on wood, um, it's been it's been a fairly light touch, which which has allowed us to do some really innovative things. And so, you know, when when you know, again, going back to the to the stimulus funds, and this is something I think Scott we talked about during the uh, during the video. You know, we we on a very short notice were able to ramp up and kick off a program for to replace to replace equipment in schools with some money we were going to lose if we weren't able to obligate it. And so because we've been a, we've we've had that successful relationship with not only the legislature, but other agencies, um, you know, we've had those relationships built. Thanks to Eddie and, and his staff. Um, and we've and we've been able to avoid the micromanaging that quite often sort of bollocks up programs like this. <laughs> the, uh, I, I love that. So I I think you went in a legislative session yesterday, right? In today. Today. Yeah, today, today went in. Um, so, so Will, I'm going to throw this question to you. So, if if you were walking through the streets of Boston and, and you bumped into a, a a representative and they said, uh, "So, why are we doing this? So, what do I tell my what what do I tell my citizens in my district of of why we're investing in this? What, what would you recommend their answer be?" Well, what I would say is the reason that we the reason that Seco does the work that they do is to help make um, local governments um, more energy efficient, more water efficient. Um, and we have really innovative programs to teach, uh, not only teach, but also um, help repair um, facilities uh, and facility managers on how to uh, make, their, make their plants, their operations more efficient. Um, that's the whole reason that SECO is around. Mm -hmm. um, and if I understand correctly, though, you're also providing an avenue for um, smaller entities within city government, town government to almost go direct to the state and not be you know, finding other avenues be beyond sort of their direct budgetary processes. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the smaller entities out there when we have <clears throat> like most states, we have uh, we have facilities, uh, you know, local government facilities that are pretty far away from uh, the major population areas, and they do have a very difficult time uh, getting the funding that they need to to do uh, retrofit type of programs uh, to teach uh, their facility operators how to, uh, you know, to ha have an efficient uh, operation. So uh, absolutely, it is a uh, is a program that um, obviously lots of large entities, uh, large local government entities uh, use, but uh, it is especially uh, beneficial for um, the smaller local government entities that maybe wouldn't have the ability that maybe a more sophisticated or larger city might have. Yeah, we're back to accessibility again across right. state. It's really interesting where we started with Colorado. Um, Robert, uh, we have a new uh, administration coming into Washington, D.C. in a few days. Does this mean that you're keeping a watchful eye on, on what Department of Energy and other federal agencies might be doing and preparing for, for that? What does that look like? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think from a global policy standpoint, we, we always want to kind of keep up with, what, with what, um, what's happening in Washington, D.C. And I think Eddie does a good job. He's involved in, in a, 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 the National Association of State Energy Organizations. Uh, much like NASCA. And so we do stay tied into that. And um, I think that's, I think that's, 
Yes, at a macro level, it's always important. Again, at a micro level, at sort of where the where the rubber hits the road, uh, you know, we've we've built some sustainability that I think we would be able we will continue on irrespective of what DOE might do over the short and even the medium term. That's great. I, lo I love that concept that you can be consistent regardless of what's happening at a federal level. You can keep the investment flowing. Um, Pam, I'm tempted to ask for a final round of lessons learned and any advice that you give to any other states. But before I do that, do you have any other questions you'd love to ask of these? I was just going to ask the team if there were any, um, you know, it kind of builds into this lessons learned, but roadblocks, challenges, um, things that you all would maybe say were red flags you'd love to share with your colleagues around the country before we do this last final wrap up? Well, I think we talked a little bit about communication and, and you know, with legislators, with our, with our sister agencies that we're serving. And so I'd like to tell you that when there are hiccups that we've got, you know, we've got good support. And, and historically, I think that that bears out. And so I think that ongoing effort to to listen to people and to be open and to be innovative and come up with those ideas I think is I think pays off in this program and others and and you know I think that's the the, the big thing we look for um, you know red flags I think we're always watchful every session always watchful for those well-meaning but but perhaps problematic ideas that would direct us in a way that that would cause us to split our resources or you know whatever and 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 again it's not that we don't we don't want that or what don't welcome that guidance from the legislature but what we know is if if the legislature ever starts micromanaging slices of this money then it gets progressively harder and harder and uh and so we're, we're we've you know again thus far been successful at convincing them so i think that's that's something we always watch for is even that even that nose under the camel's tent that looks like it's a great idea. You know, we're we're very quick to go to our members and say, happy to do it, but but let's leave a don't do the bill. We'll just do it for you. Uh -huh. And and you know, if it's a good idea, we want to do that. And and that's we've been successful at that. I th I think that's great advice. It's interesting. And almost the larger the fund gets, the more interesting it gets for what was the metaphor you used? The camel under the tent? Um, that uh, you're proactively managing that or engaging with that to make sure you deliver the outcomes. I love that. Uh, Eddie, Will, any, any lessons that you'd want to share with other states that are going down this path? Well, for us, it's really uh, constant outreach. There's turnover. Every local government, every K-12 school, every public entity has turnover. And you have turnover in uh, key areas. So you establish a relationship with one School district, the person retires or gets promoted or goes someplace else and doesn't uh, let his uh, person who follows up after him know about you. So then you're starting the relationship all over again. So it's a constant outreach process. It's a matter of when you provided a service for, let's say, a school district or a local government, making sure you follow up afterwards uh, to see if they're doing anything. And if the contact person is the same, or if there's any additional services that you can provide to them that they may or may not be aware of. Uh, I guess the one thing I would add is just, um, and we're very fortunate in this respect, um, we have an incredibly uh, qualified um, seasoned staff uh, in SECO. Uh, Eddie, under Eddie's leadership, um, we've done some really great things with training um, and uh, we've built some consistency in the staff such that um, they, they, they know their programs, they know the people that they're working with, um, they, they are very good about, as Eddie said, reaching out uh, and uh, promoting the programs. Uh, so we've been very fortunate, uh, just truthfully on a staff side, uh, not to have a whole lot of turnover. Um, and when we do have turnover, um, we can quickly get um, the, you know, the new person in and, and up to speed uh, such that, you know, it's like it's, you know, we have no seamless or it's, it's a pretty seamless transition. So. Thank you. And, and Robert, is it fair to say that if there's a, another state that's interested in replicating some of this, you would all be open to a phone call? Absolutely. That's great.
That's great. Well, Pam, I, I, I measure myself every night by the dinner table conversation I have with my three little girls. And I didn't think it was going to be about flushing toilets in the Department of Corrections within the state of Texas, but it turns out it is. So um, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. This has um, been really helpful and we really appreciate the time you invested in us, especially because you're entering session to, today. Good luck with those conversations and Pam, back to you over in Lexington. Thank right. You. Thanks so Thank much, you. Scott, and to the Texas team. Yeah, there was some theme flowing between plumbing in Texas and plumbing in Virginia. So <laughs> it makes for my afternoon uh, and enjoyment as well. But thanks for everybody for being with us today um, to our teams in Colorado and Virginia and Texas and Missouri, not only for your time today to really unpack and expand this conversation, but also for all the time that you've given Scott and his team and the Lexington NASCA team to bring together the state micro reviews. These have been so, so insightful. Um, as we've all mentioned today, they are on NASCA's Knowledge Center. Please go listen to the uh, on-demand recording, learn more. And I know all of our state teams would be happy to share more information via phone or email. We look forward to having with you, you all with us on Thursday, where we're going to continue conversations with our corporate partners. Um, we're going to be talking with representatives from JLL, from UKG, formerly Kronos, and also iValua. So great conversations around telework and um, returning to work. Great things coming up on Thursday. So we will see you all then. Thanks again for being with us. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.